Psalm 19.1 says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. The creation story in Genesis was not designed to teach science. It's designed to teach us how great our God is. And I want to make sure that you get that big idea as we are studying the book of Genesis, especially these first few chapters, that this creation story is not designed to teach science. It's designed to teach us how great our God is. Amen? We began a study through the book of Genesis a couple of weeks ago. And last time, we discussed some of the many ideas that have been put forward for reconciling the Genesis account of creation with the modern scientific understanding of how the universe came into being. One of the things that we noted is that not everyone within Christianity agrees on how the days in Genesis chapter 1 should be understood. Some take these days to be literal, 24-hour days. Some understand them to be epochs or eons of time of indeterminate length. Some believe that the author's intent here is to present a condensed, idealized, figurative, poetic presentation of the creation event. Now, there are good, Bible-believing, Jesus-loving, God-glorifying people who hold each of these views. The essential non-negotiable truths for us to hold to are these, that God exists, God created, and God entered our world in the person of Jesus Christ to reconcile us to himself. The rest of this stuff is not something for us to divide over. One day, when we are all standing before the Lord, I'm convinced that we're going to have a great big belly laugh at ourselves over how wrong we all are about all of this stuff. Today, we're going to take a look at the rest of Genesis chapter 1. So if you have your Bible, flip over to Genesis chapter 1. And I want to give a quick review of what we've looked at so far in the first five verses to really set the stage for the rest of the story. The book begins, the chapter begins with the words, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. In these opening words of the book, we have a declaration of the existence of God. Before everything else, there was God, the eternal, all-existing God. This opening sentence tells us that God is creative, that He determined to create and He created. He deliberately, joyfully created the heavens and the earth, bringing this amazing universe into existence from nothing. This opening sentence of the book also tells us something about us, that we are precious to God. It says God created the heavens and the earth. The earth is certainly not the center of the universe, and its overall significance in the universe is unknown to us. But this account, <clears throat> which has been written for the residents of this planet, our home is mentioned in the opening words of the book. God wants us to know that he made us and that we are precious to him. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. This verse describes the condition of the earth before the Lord begins to prepare it as a home for human beings. We have an earth that's described as without form, a waste, desolate, it's void, it's empty, it's lifeless, it's in darkness, it's, there's no light, it's chaos. Into this situation of formless, lifeless chaos, the Spirit of God is hovering over the face of the waters like a mother bird hovering over her chicks. The image we are given here is one of intimate care. God the Spirit comes hovering over our world spreading his wings of love and provision, bringing order from chaos, life from emptiness, beauty from desolation. And then beginning in verse 3, we have what's described as day one. It says, And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. So the first thing that God created in our world is light. And this 
could have included the actual physical light producing things in the universe, such as the sun and the other stars. It's for sure that it means that God brought his own good presence into our world. His light, his energy, his truth, his glory. It says he created day and night for us. Looking at this from a modern day technical standpoint, we might speculate that God spun our world up so that the earth would have a 24-hour rotation cycle. It's very unlikely that that's what Moses had in mind when he wrote these words, though. What we have here is God establishing for us the daily cycle for our lives, day and night, a time of activity and a time for rest. It's interesting, our our bodies, they function best on a 24-hour cycle. It's built into us. We were made for this world, and this world was made for us. Do you remember this, this description of creation in Genesis was originally given for the people of Israel who had just recently been delivered from hundreds of years of slavery under the Egyptians? The Egyptians, they had a polytheistic worldview, believing in many gods, which all influenced various aspects of their lives. Some sources say there were over 2,000 different gods of varying significance worshipped by the ancient Egyptians. The sun god, Ra, or Re, was their most important god. The Lord is telling his people here in Genesis that he created everything, The Lord made the objects, even the sun and the moon, which the Egyptians worshipped as gods. The Lord even made day and night, water and land and sky, things that the Egyptians believed were realms for their gods. Imagine an aquarium of sentient fish. Just go with me for a minute here. That worship the objects in their aquarium like the ceramic sunken ship that they swim around and the warming light overhead and the, and the bubbler in the back corner. And God, he comes and he tells his fish that none of these things in the aquarium are gods. Even though all these other fish, they've been worshiping these things. He goes, no, 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 none of these things are gods. They're all things that I put there for you. Not only that, He says, the very aquarium itself I made. I made all of it for you. And God said, in verse 6, Let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. And God made the expanse and separated the waters that were under the expanse from the waters that were above the expanse, and it was so. And God called the expanse heaven, or sky, and there was evening and there was morning the second day. So on this second day, God separates the water that enveloped the earth by creating an expanse, the heavens, or the sky, with water then above the expanse and water below the expanse. There's a symmetry here in this first day that we'll see carried out in the rest of it too, that on the first day, God divided the light so that there would be day and night, and now he divides the water so that there is water above and water below. There is the water that provides the source for precipitation, rain, and so forth, and there is the water which will become the rivers and the oceans and such. We're going to see this same kind of symmetry of separating or dividing play out in the third day as well. On verse 9, it says, And God said, Let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth, and the waters that were gathered together he called seas, and God saw that it was good. So we have the same kind of symmetry here as noted in the first two days. Here God divides the waters that are below the expanse, below the sky, below the heavens, making dry land and the seas and such. So there is day and night, and then water above and below the sky, and now dry land and seas. Verse 11, And God said, Let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed and fruits, 
bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind on the earth. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed according to their own kinds, and trees bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. There was evening and there was morning the third day. So the Lord brings forth plant life on the land. And it says, each according to its kind. All of this vegetation was created with the ability to replicate itself. It was important for the Israelites of that time to understand that the Lord was the author of all life, and it was the Lord who created and designed all of this life to reproduce. See, when the Israelites saw new plants springing forth from seeds, new baby lambs being born, their own sons and daughters being born, they would know that the Lord is the author of all of it. It's, it's not some magic trick. There's not some fertility goddess making these things happen. The one true God, the Lord, made all things, sustains all things, and he built into the very fabric of the creation the ability for living things to reproduce themselves over and over again. We humans, we, we can make some pretty amazing machines. The automobile, something that we take for granted, is a very complex, sophisticated machine. Computers, nuclear submarines, jets, satellites, Mars rovers, nanobots. Now there's something that we're still a long way from mastering, though, and that is self-replicating complex machines. But the Lord, he's filled our planet with all kinds of self-replicating complex machines. And these various machines that the Lord has made, they not only know how to make more of themselves, but they also know how to harvest and refine all of the necessary raw materials needed to make more of themselves. They know how to sustain themselves. They know how to repair themselves. And the overall system itself recycles everything. These machines that are, are made of, so, so that the raw materials are used over and over again to make new machines. Nothing is wasted in this amazing world that the Lord created. Now we, on the other hand, I mean, we are burying ourselves under piles of our own filth and trash that we've made. That's not what God made here, though. That's our own doing. His world is this beautiful, amazing, balanced, self-replicating thing. Verse 14, and the Lord said, let there be lights in the expanse of the universe to separate the day from the night. And let them be for the signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And the Lord made the two great lights the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. And God set them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth, to rule over the day and over the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good, and there was evening and there was morning the fourth day. I want us to notice how the description that we have here in the Genesis creation story that it's told from the point of view of someone on earth rather than someone, you know, floating out over the universe watching everything that's taking place in all of the universe. The focus of the Genesis story is humanity on planet earth and what it looks like from that vantage point. There was a general reference to light on day one when the Lord said, let there be light. Now we have more specific descriptions of lights. The sun and moon, the stars, the various constellations are mentioned here. And these various lights 
are to provide signs and mark seasons, distinguish day from night, and generally light our planet. Now, that doesn't mean that's the only function that these things have, but that's the function that they have for us as people looking up from our vantage point. I made mention of this before, but a very important message that's being communicated is that these celestial objects are not gods. They, they have been made by the Lord, and rather than these things being worshipped and served as gods, they provide services and enjoyment for us. Now, that doesn't mean that these objects in space have no other purpose other than to serve us and give us something to marvel at. It's estimated that there are 10 trillion galaxies in the universe with 100 billion stars in each of them. That's a trillion trillion stars, or one with 24 zeros after it. Given the amazing creativity of our God, I think it doubtful that this planet is the only place in all trillion trillion stars that there's life. But that's only my own personal belief. But on our planet, in particular 3,500 years ago, looking up into the sky, this describes the function of these objects that we can see. Verse 23 says, And God said, Let the waters swarm with swarms of living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the heavens. So God created the great sea creatures and every living creature that moves with which the waters swarm according to their kinds and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them saying, be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters in the seas and let birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening and there was morning the fifth day. The language used here allows for virtually all types of creatures that live in the water and fly in the air. Everything from whales to insects to amoebas. Let the waters swarm with swarms of living creatures. I, I love that description. It, it means packed full. The water and the sky are swarming with swarms of living things. And we can say the same thing about the land. And it's true, the earth is filled with living things. I mean, there are more critters living on your skin right now <laughs> that you can't even see that none of us really want to think about. <laughs> Did you know that it's estimated that there are one million spiders per acre of land on earth. Some of you guys, because <gasps> I know you hate spiders. <laughs> or to put it another way, there are 23 spiders per square foot on average on this planet. That means that on average, in the space that you're occupying right now, there are at least 50 spiders. You're all like going, probably not in this room. On average, there are more than 50 spiders in the space that you occupy. The teeming of life, the swarms of swarms that God created is amazing. The, the, the amount of life on this planet blows your mind. We haven't even discovered all of the species that exist on this planet. Not even now, after all these years that we've been here. We're still discovering new stuff, new living things. It says, according to their kinds, as we noted before with plants on day three, all of these amazing creatures that the Lord has made are self-replicating. They each have the ability to make more like themselves. The Lord built into each one the know-how and the ability to do that. 
Every cell has the information needed to do that. Twenty-four, and God said, "Let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, living livestock and creeping things and beasts of the earth according to their kinds." And it was so. And God made the beasts of the earth according to their kinds, and the livestock according to their kinds, and everything that creeps on the ground according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. So land creatures are created, and the language here, again, allows for all types of biological life, every living thing on the earth. Beginning in verse 26, we are now introduced to the pinnacle, the centerpiece of God's creation on planet earth, human beings. Everything in the story has been leading up to this. Verse 26, then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Let us make man. This is a different beat compared to all of the other beats of the creation story up to this point. For, for everything leading up to this point, God is recorded to have said, let something happen or let something come into being. And now, it's as if God pauses and he says, I've made everything ready. It's time now to bring forth the ones that it's all been made for. The rest of creation was brought to life at the spoken word of God. Human beings are brought to life through the breath of God. In Genesis 2-7, it tells us that he formed the man from the dust of the earth and then he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and the man became a living being. He said, let us make man in our image. It's, it's believed that this is a reference to the Trinity of God. God is talking to himself. The Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's interesting to note that the Hebrew word translated God that's used throughout this chapter is the plural form of the Hebrew word for God. He says, let us make man in our image, after our likeness. Humans are unique among all of the creatures on this planet. We're the only ones that it said were created in God's image. We don't know the full implication of what that means to be created in the image of God, nor do we have time to fully explore it today. But one thing it means is this, is that God made us in such a way that we are uniquely capable of having a personal relationship with him. The Egyptians and other pagan peoples of the ancient time in which Moses wrote Genesis, they made gods for themselves in their own image. Their, their gods look like animals and people. The Lord, he now comes and he tells his people that he's made us in his image rather than the other way around. He says, I don't look like the stuff you've made. You look like me. I've made you in my image. You share unique characteristics that come from me. I made you in my image. I made you in such a way that you can have a personal relationship with me so that you can know me. You can enjoy me. You can worship me. We're unique. There's something special about us. 
something really special about us. God made us in a special way. So to let them have dominion. God placed us over the rest of the planet as rulers and caretakers. The Lord created a worthy king and queen for his planet, human beings. We were perfectly suited and equipped to rule over the rest of the planet and take care of it. Sadly, we forsook that divine appointment that we were given, and now the rest of creation also suffers because of it as it waits to be redeemed with us. It waits for its king and its queen to be redeemed so that it too can share in that redemption. Romans 8, 19, it says, For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now, and not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we, wait, as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. That's crazy, isn't it? 27, it says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. He created both male and female humans, and both sexes bear the image of God. And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and fill the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. God blessed the humans, it says, giving them three assignments, to reproduce, to fill the earth, and to rule over the rest of the planet. And some have jokingly remarked that the only directive that human beings have faithfully followed throughout history has been the command to reproduce. The command to fill the earth, it required God's intervention in Genesis 11. Otherwise, humanity might still be gathered around the Tower of Babel to this day, attempting to build a tower that reaches to the abode of God. The command to rule over the rest of the planet, it hasn't gone so well either, you know. We read a moment ago how the rest of the planet suffers under the consequences of humanity's fallen condition. Humanity's use of this planet has not been a pretty thing to look back on throughout history. God didn't give us dominion over the planet to selfishly burn it to the ground as we have largely been doing since he handed us the keys. He intended for us to be gracious and wise caretakers like himself. And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth and every tree with seed in its fruit, you shall have them for food. And every beast of the earth and every bird of the heavens and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. Apparently, not until after the great flood of Noah in Genesis chapter 9, verses 1 and 3, does God officially give human beings permission to eat animals for food in addition to plants. But one of the big ideas for us to get from these verses is to see the Lord as our provider. James tells us in James 1.17 that every good thing, every good thing comes to us from our generous and good God. In the ancient world, the pagan Religions depicted the gods as demanding payment from humans 
to ensure a plentiful harvest and increasing flocks and growing families. They offered offerings and sacrifice and all of these other things as a way to to buy off as as an insurance policy, to, to win the God's favor so that the God will do a good thing for them. The Lord, in contrast, He provides all good things for His people. Their offerings given to God are expressions of thanks for what He's done, for His blessings, rather than insurance that He will bless them. It's a profound difference, you guys. It's a profound difference. One is a payment, and one is an expression of gratitude For what has already been given freely, generously to you. But you know, people's understanding of God has not changed very much from ancient times, has it? People still see God as a force that needs to be bargained with to get a blessing. We need to prove our worthiness to him in order for him to be good to us. We need to earn his approval and blessing. See, people, they treat each other that way. They make others earn their approval and blessing. And we assume, God, he must be like that too. He must be like us. But you know what? That is just another form of making God in our own image. God made us in his image, not the other way around. God made the sun and the moon to serve us rather than them being gods for us to serve. God provides our needs because he's good. Not because we have bought him off in some way. See, Jesus, he he tried to get this idea across us way back when he was here too, in Matthew chapter 6. Verse 25, Jesus is talking here and he says, Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life. And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They they neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arraigned like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you? Oh, you of little faith. Therefore, Do not be anxious, saying, what shall I eat, or what shall I drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles, the pagans, the unbeliever, seeks after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Skip down to verse 7 in in the next chapter, Matthew 7, 11. Jesus says, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks, it will be opened. Or which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, you know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? You see the difference? The last verse of the chapter says this. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. So when God, he he, he looks over the completed work, and he declares it very good. 
very good, abundantly, exceedingly good, pleasant, beautiful. There's an odd chapter break here because the, the first three verses of chapter two really complete the story that's told here. It says, thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it, God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. Now, this is not a rest because God is exhausted from all of the hard work that he's put out making the universe. It's like, whew, i got to take a breath. No. His energy and power are boundless. It's a rest in that he completed the great work of the creation. Now, that doesn't mean that God has ceased his involvement with our universe, as if he wound it up like some giant machine and then let it go to fend for itself. No. The Lord has continued to be involved in our lives since our very first day of existence, and he will continue to always be involved in our lives. And in this resting on the seventh day, the Lord, he establishes a pattern for his people, the Israelites in particular, for their own day of rest. The Sabbath, which is the fourth commandment of the Ten Commandments. In closing this morning, God made you. God made you. He knows every single molecule that makes you up. He's familiar with every strand of hair on your head. He knows every turn of every fingerprint. He understands why you're happy and why you're sad and why you're depressed and why you're joyful. He knows what you need and what you want. There's not a single thing about you that God does not understand completely. What a comfort it is to know that on the sixth day, God said, let us make man and woman in our image. You're not an accident. You're not an afterthought. You're not a lucky chance in a sea of a billion trillion random events. You were deliberately and lovingly made by the Lord to know him, to worship him, and to enjoy him forever. Psalm 8, verse 3, it says, When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man? that you're mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him. Psalm 139, verse 14, it says, I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Let's bow our heads. Father, I pray uh, today that these amazing truths that you made us to know you, to worship you, to enjoy you forever, that that settles in on our heart today in a fresh way. I pray that every single person here knows how precious they are to you. How intimately he, you know them, Lord. I pray that this, this amazing truth, it carries us this week as we go through our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.